Hey everyone, you're watching Care Minds Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel. Today, I'm talking to Ellie Lidman, Head of Engineering at Modern Health, and we're exploring topics of uh, coaching, uh, technical product management, and engineering. I hope you enjoy. Let's get started. Ellie, thank you very much for joining this Care Minds Podcast episode. It's so great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Ellie, you are a Head of Engineering at Modern Health, a mental health and wellness app. You speak regularly on management and leadership at different events. You uh, provide coaching and mentorship on career advancements, helping people setting, achieving their goals, overcoming imposter syndrome, things of that nature. I'm super curious, how did your personal career transform from a technical project manager implementing EMRs for some of the largest healthcare organizations in the U.S.? And partially quoting your uh, website, uh, contributing to that role without uh, a prior formal engineering training to now being a head of engineering and also uh, creating, mentoring, and leading technical uh, product management teams. So please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, I definitely have a bit of a non-standard career path, but I think uh, through my experience really going deep, especially in the healthcare industry and healthcare technology and operating uh, as you know, a strategic leader within various organizations, um, you know, I was able to build up that base of, of knowledge that was that allowed me to be a strategic leader and manager within the TPM function. And that already is situated as a strategic influencer within engineering. And so I was already doing things like architecture strategy and organization strategy, uh, being able to marry together some of that healthcare industry experience, um, as well as just understanding, you know, the business uh, that drove what was going on within engineering together. So was over time, given the opportunity to, you know, continue to grow as a leader within those kinds of organizations, and then was already doing, I think, the job of, you know, an engineering director over time. So was given additional engineering teams um, and continued to grow from there, um, you know, as, uh, you know, always one of the main leaders focused on how was the department scaling from both a technology and operation standpoint. So over time, I was able to continue to grow to become a, a VP of engineering, uh, which I'm currently doing uh, at Modern Health. So I get to lead the entirety of the department, leveraging a lot of that experience and those those strategic thinking skills. Awesome. And you've uh, touched also on some of the important points that we are definitely going to explore further in this podcast. Given your mentorship experience, how would you define the challenges of career growth for uh, technical product managers in medium sized and large sized companies, the, the types of companies you have experience working at? So I think uh, whether it's, you know, technical project managers, technical product managers, um, I do think at a lot of companies, those are some of the the least defined roles are the ones that are going to be some of the smaller, uh, smaller teams. And because of that, there can be some, you know, early growth that you can really achieve really quickly, which is really great. But as structure gets introduced, I'd say that those organizations are often quite flat. And so because of that, you know, growth opportunities can be a bit more challenging to navigate. And also if those roles are less defined or a career ladder is coming out later, um, you know, than when you started the organization, for example, there could be a lack of alignment around what expectations look like at each level and also what growth could look like. So I would say it's it's really important uh, to, uh, as early as possible, really request uh, some of that structure and those expectations so you can know what the growth opportunities look like and how you can um, navigate around them. So I think like, you know, you'll need to work probably extra hard in those organizations, especially to, you know, show your value and your impact. And, um, and that can be also be really hard uh, when the company is just starting up. Um, so I, I come from the startup space. So that's something that I think I've, I could have a lot of experience and, and, you know, you might not have all the tools you need to even demonstrate your impact. Maybe uh, you don't have product analytics instituted yet, for example. And so being able to, to show the value Value of your work can be a lot harder. Um, so it's really critically important to understand as early as possible um, and align with the management team, you know, what are the expectations uh, for what good looks like, and then be able to find the right 
tooling, resources, whatever it might be, to be able to, to demonstrate that. Very good points. You were recently talking about uh, transforming one's tactical thinking into strategic thinking, attributing some of the challenges that people uh, face within organizations career ladder wise. What are, in your opinion, the foundations of uh, strategic uh, thinking for uh, self-promoting? Yeah, so I think uh, with self-promotion, uh, and I've done I've done very lengthy talks on this, so I have so many thoughts. Um, but the way that I the way that I think about self-promotion, uh, a lot of it has to do with um, really understanding how success is measured, which I think uh, a lot of it comes down to impact and what the business is trying to do. So I think that's really valid and something to pepper into how you are optimizing your work. So think about, you know, what business goals are you trying to achieve? Because that's going to demonstrate business value. But then also how is success measured relative to that career ladder? And it's really, really hard to have I'll say aligned conversations uh, with your management team um, on your growth if you don't have something to point out to show your agreements around expectations. From there, uh, I would say once you have that understanding, uh, would strongly recommend continuing to identify when you are showing that kind of value, when you are expressing those skills, um, and also you know generally what your growth goals are. You should be doing these things regularly um, with your managers. That's the first level in which you need to be self-promoting, um, letting them know all the great things that you're doing uh, that are uh, adding value to the business in the right ways. Secondly, I, I always say uh, self-promote at the department level. So how is your work connecting back to value for your sub-organization or your peers uh, within your department? Um, that way, uh, that becomes increasingly more visible with other members of management, other peers that might be able to give feedback and can start to draw the story about how you draw the story together about how you are uh, providing value and influencing within your broader community. And then I would say the third level of self-promotion uh, is at the company level. So really, you know, if we think about that same flow of influence um, and impact, uh, being able to share uh, how the work that you're doing um, is really driving the company ahead and finding those opportunities to present that. Uh, to everyone. Um, those are also critically important. That's then also giving you more visibility with um, also senior leadership, maybe C-suite, basically this entire chain of, of leadership and management. That's also the same chain that's going to be uh, discussing your growth over time and approving your promotions. Um, so uh, be sure to be promoting through those groups and speaking their language as to how that's connecting to business value that they care about. And I think that also gives you opportunities to get sponsorship as well, um, get the feedback you need uh, so you can you know, build those cases as well for growth. I love that you were touching based on this. This uh, sounds like a very holistic approach. I was particularly interested in asking about the aspect of uh, communicating and uh, influencing in the right way, of course, when it's aligned with the company goals and everything. Uh, when it comes to the upper management, the stakeholders, sometimes it's very hard to cut through the noise of the day-to-day. -day. How do you do that efficiently? What are your go-tos that typically work for you? So I think if you want to you know, communicate and influence uh, with other stakeholders or with senior leadership, I would try to make sure that you uh, find um, those opportunities so where you can work through a particular issue or conflict together um, and really frame things in similar common language. And I think that's often where, uh, especially across functionally, there's quite a few misses and people don't understand the value or what others are optimizing for. So I think that um, as you approach interactions with uh, other cross-functional stakeholders, it's really important to uh, acknowledge what are your shared goals. Um, and that might be the those top, um, you know, OKRs that maybe you're both driving towards. But commonly, we have these shared goals that we're trying to achieve. Maybe it's gaining uh, more revenue or gaining more market share, right? We can all point to that and say, okay, that makes sense. We're all trying to do that. But then there's all these sub-problems. Um, and often, the tension that might arise uh, or um, a lack of understanding that can inhibit our influence comes from constraints or different 
individuals needing to optimize for additional goals within their uh, their departments that they might be more accountable for. For example, in engineering, that might be uh, you know human resources or the scalability of the system, the stability of the system. Those are things that I'm accountable for. Uh, but maybe on the sales side, for example, that's maybe they're really just trying to please customers and, and you know reach their sales quotas, which is totally reasonable. We're all trying to reach the same goals, but we're optimizing for different things. And so th- these uh, these differences can lead to uh, tension. And so I think it's really good to really speak to, you know, what are the shared goals, understand the goals of the, um, the other individuals, uh, what do they care about, what are their constraints, and really actually like give voice to those things. Uh, and that way, uh, you can show up in a way that where you can um, basically sp- tr- attempt to speak their language. So you can describe impact or rationally uh, work through something that maybe you have differing opinions on um, in a way that's very, you know, unemotional and is completely connected back to what are we trying to do on behalf of the business. And this is like a classic conundrum, I think, uh, in my world, right? Uh, I am often trying to drive value via very technical initiatives that might not be well understood in terms of their value to other members of the company. And so it's really important to think about your audience and what do they what do they care about? What are we all trying to do? So when I go and say, hey, we need to uh, reduce our lead time to changes by investing in our CICD pipeline so it can be more. That doesn't mean anything to my, my peer group, and that's OK, but I can still have a thoughtful conversation with them and say, hey, I know you care about reducing costs and also increasing the speed in which we can build new products so we can accelerate our time to market for differentiated products. Um, so we can, you know, continue to ensure business continuity and be the leader in in our space. All of those things will make sense to my peers. Those are all shared goals. And I can show my impact by saying, hey, here's how we were able to move these metrics in a way that ultimately enables these other areas of the business. Yeah, I totally agree. Amazing points. Definitely owning your surroundings and uh, also um, communicating efficiently, uh, attributing to the same goals that people have together. We've talked uh, on some of our podcasts about uh, product management being a fairly new career, and sometimes it's not very much defined. With with regards to the technical product management, this, uh, I think, is uh, something also super niche. Can you please touch base on the subject of why technical product managers are key for any health tech company? What kind of value they bring? Yeah, so technical product managers are very, very important for healthcare because it's a quite a specialized and highly regulated and rapidly changing industry. I think that uh, there, there's all these different recurring players in this complex web of relationships and integrations, and there's all these new new players and, and uh, resources and rules surfacing constantly. And I think that because of that, we really need to have people in this role so we can basically uh, support are the foundations of our systems uh, to meet the needs of the industry and the ability for a lot of companies to also work within it, but disrupt it. Um, And I think that requires quite a lot of focus on um, ensuring that our systems are um, able to integrate with and scale alongside or operate meaningfully differently, but still play by the rules. Um, And so I think TPMs play uh, a really important role in that. And that's also where, you know, you end up getting that same marriage of the the techno-functional side of things, as well as the healthcare expertise needing to be um, really, really well understood so we can coordinate across all the different engineering teams and also external partners uh, to ensure that our systems are actually operating in a way that scales and makes sense. Like the amount of times that I've had to really go deep uh, with engineering and product on how are we architecting our data models and how are we architecting our integrations with third parties? All of those things are quite complex and having someone that's really spending their time thinking about those problems and able to drive, drive in a way that allows us to be successful, maybe even do something different. uh, I just think that's critically important. Yeah, I would definitely agree. And also the importance of a skill of connecting a like solving a complex technical issue and connecting the puzzle to 
the business outcome. Yeah, and uh, talking about the importance of doing a due diligence before uh, going into a new company, uh, also career-wise, how would you go about immerse? Like, what would you typically suggest to people when they are immersing themselves in the business context? Yes, they do their research, but once again, there is a time when they're right in front of it. And what are the things that typically work for you that you would suggest trying? When you are maybe joining a new company, let's say, you know, it's one of the first things that you want to understand. Taking a look at, honestly, the basics, looking first at the the mission, the vision, the strategy, the values, any explicit goals and projects and OKRs. I think those are going to be the top things that are going to let you know Uh you know, what's going on here and why, what are we really trying to achieve and how have we thought about going about doing that? And I view values as constraints. Um, That doesn't mean that they're bad things. It just means that, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, understood ways of operating as well that might end up having some kind of impact on how you go about achieving uh, the various goals. Uh, So really understanding what are you trying to do? And that way you can know what uh, what impact that you're driving for and how that ladders up throughout the business. I think additionally, understanding what phase a company is in is super important. Uh, what kind of financing they have, um, what kind of market and strategic moment are they in? Uh, you know, do you have product market fit yet? Are you profitable? Uh, are you, uh, do you have an opportunity or have you cornered the market or are you in a highly competitive space? Are you going through hyper growth? Um, do you have a down economy, right? We all we are dealing with a lot of these different things, but a lot of that paints the picture of uh, what are the what are those constraints? Maybe even what are the, some of the values? What are some things that are understood about how we're making decisions um, because of the environment that you're working within? And kind of swinging back to the financial side of things, I think this one is. Uh, probably the least invested in area uh, that I see for for a lot of folks, but I think it's super important for everyone to understand the financials of every business they're working within. Um, and if you don't have an understanding of financial basics, it's you know go ahead and take some time to to learn about uh, the, the the simple things. But um, you know I'd understand like you know who are the customers, where is money actually coming from. Um, how is money actually made? What are the what are the variables that would influence uh, revenue? And then, you know, what are the financials across the board? I think ROI on specific investments, um, really important to know, you know, what what's the cash, what are the cash cows, what are the cash drainers, how much money are you making per per particular sale or sales interaction? Also think about things like budgets and runway, you know, how much money do you, are you really playing with? If you have a lot or very little, uh, that can really impact how you might show up as a decision maker or leader within the business. Yeah. This is a very extensive answer, and I think it also uh, answers my uh, question about asking the right uh, questions and the importance of that. Everybody is pretty much aware of that, but um, when it comes to the actual asking, sometimes it's very, very challenging. You are specializing in scaling uh, technical product management teams and engineering teams, um, combining technology and operations. How do you do that, and what are the three components when it comes to the technology, and what are the three components when it comes to the operations side of it? Yeah, great. I, I love this. I, I view technology and operations as super hard to detangle when I think about scaling. Uh, so this question is, is exciting to me because uh, I think they truly start to look like one another um, because you need standardization and DevOps culture to make development more efficient and stable. You need technology to scale your operations so they're lighter lift and you reduce resource utilization. Um, so I I think like when I think about technology, the the top three things I would say, uh, the first is really just like, which I think across any of these roles is relevant, you know, deciding what you want to be core to your business and what you want your team to be spending time on. So what do you really want to have your development staff and your product managers iterating on versus what do you want to just get off the shelf because it's not something that is uh, is going to be a core differentiator and is really just, you know, something that you need to run the business. Um, I think 
Another one is just finding technological ways to make development more efficient. Um, there are many ways to go about doing this, many different um, standardized assets you can create, you know, like service templates, uh, what have you, uh, so you can ensure people are moving quickly and not having to reinvent the wheel. And similarly, I would say just like standardization and like uh, like similar cross-platform standards and processes so you can ensure that things are being built in the same way um, and you don't have to rebuild things later or incur a lot of tech debt when you realize that some things weren't built to particular standards that are actually truly problematic. I, I would say on the operations side, uh, the the top three things for scale. First one, one of my favorites, strong people management. Uh, so you might need to significantly scale your hiring function because you're hiring a lot of people uh, and you need to make sure that they're going to fit into your new organizational structure that you're probably developing on the fly. Additionally, onboarding them and then performance management. I think performance management's a huge one to make sure that you're uh, you are holding people accountable in a consistent way. I would also say communication flows for scale is the next thing to land. I think when you're much smaller, uh, you know, you can have fewer people communicating about fewer things. And then, of course, there becomes more roles, more people, more topics and more distance. And so ensuring that you have the right flows and the right folks accountable to understand how bidirectional communication works is very important and constantly also coaching people on <laughs> what needs to flow through those channels. And then I think my last operational one, uh, last top three, uh, is uh, decision-making strategies. Uh, so I think that uh, decision-making becomes more spread out um, over time. So similar to the communication being more tight-knit, decision-making also gets more distributed, despite the fact that more individuals over time become more targeted as the accountable parties. Um, so there's less consensus uh, driven decision making, more accountable parties, but then there's more complexity to how we reason around decision making. Um, and so making sure that people understand how decisions are made, who's accountable for them, and then that some decisions are shared and there's a shared process for um, across functions for achieving uh, a resolution. I think that's another important part of scale because, because as I mentioned, things just get so distributed. It also makes decision making diluted. Yeah. I would completely agree. And also uh, very important to understand which um, decision-making aspects are shareable and which are not, and how do those uh, contribute to the agility of the company, respectively. As of the time of this recording, yesterday, April 5th, uh, you uh, spoke at the Enrich Conversations event, touching base on the subject of how to manage managers. I'm curious about that experience. What did people there wanted to know more about? Did you spot some kind of like common denominator thread? within those questions? Yeah, um, yeah, we covered a lot of ground during during the chat. I felt like thematically the things that came up uh, the most were uh, the common, I'd say is the most common challenge uh, when you are uh, becoming a, a manager of managers, uh, which is how do you keep a pulse on things, um, especially without micromanaging, um, right? You're, it's, it could be the first time that you're away from the details and you need to rely on someone else as an extension of yourself to be making the right decisions, but you need to make sure that they're making the right decisions without actually being <laughs> in every single decision without being in all the context of seeing all the issues firsthand. So I'd say that's, that was a, a very common thread uh, where people wanted some advice. I think also um, within that, you know, when do you go deep? When do you ask questions? When do you, you know, trust but verify? Uh, so a lot of that is really, you know, how do you structure your communication flow? How are you sourcing the right information? How do you rally around the topics that you both care about the most? And a lot of that comes back to how do we reason around the business goals? And so a lot of that is, you know, very, very thematic in terms of how I talk about management. And it's not really anything that's that nuanced, uh, but really just like, you know, what do you optimize for? You optimize for how are we all working together to achieve the business goals? And, you know, so I maybe said some pretty, uh, pretty uh, controversial things in, in the sense of saying like that is core and that actually comes ahead of just optimizing for pure team happiness, right? Those things go together. 
for example, right? You need to have a, a happy and performing team that is not super stressed out in order to achieve your goals. Um, but right, it all ladders up to, you know, how do you organize your time around those things? So I think there was some interesting conversation because of that about how do you balance business goals and team morale? And that was, I, I, I think I've just been talking the last two days about values. Um, so I think to me, that comes down to values, right? Like if you value work-life balance, and that's something that's critically important, if you value mental health, well, that's a that's a happy constraint that needs to be factored into how you run your teams. Um, at the end of the day, everything still ladders back up to how are you organizing your teams to achieve to achieve the business goals. Awesome. And I was also curious, um, given your acumen and knowledge about these things, how do you uh, implement them in your living outside of work? How do they, these principles help you uh, be a better person? Oh, wow. That's a very heavy question. I love it. Um, yeah, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about what I want to optimize for in my own life. And so I, I don't view work, um, entirely separate from my personal life. I think it's a, it's a happy blend of the two that make up, uh, the entirety of, of my existence. And, uh, when I, have taken time to really reflect, which I've done through life coaching, um, lots of like self-reflection exercises. I've, I've come to understand what are the what are the top values I want to live by, what are the top goals I have for myself, and what are the really the the feelings I want to optimize for. I, I'm a huge proponent of of emotions at work and emotions being a driver uh, for decisions that we make in our lives. And I genuinely believe that a lot of the the things that we want to aim for are actually tied to to feelings that we want to uh, make sure that we're feeling. And so I think when I, I, I apply a lot of how I reason around, um, you know, work goals, similarly to personal ones, what I want to optimize for in my personal life, what, what goals do I want to achieve and why? And so when I look at work, when I look at things I'm doing outside of work, um, you know, I'm trying to optimize for some particular experience. Uh, for example, I love like related to work. I love mentoring other people and, creating opportunities for others so they can grow. So that's something that gives me a lot of energy and joy. And so being able to have a job where I can do that on a daily basis is really exciting for me. And I also do that outside of work with mentorship. And then additionally, sometimes I just want to have fun. And so maybe I'll I'll create a to-do list that has, you know, do a podcast talk um, and podcast interview uh, alongside of, you know, go rollerblading because I think that's really fun. Like all those things need balance. And I think using similar frameworks to think about uh, how you achieve your goals at work, how you achieve your goals in your personal life, um, you know, you'll just be able to create the best plan for yourself to become whatever you want to be. Awesome. And what would you recommend uh, people to check out in terms of like resources that are interested to explore a topic of optimization for be it a personal life goals or the work goals that they have? I always recommend uh, finding someone to talk to. So I might not have one specific like book to read necessarily on the topic, but I have had a lot of success uh, with life coaching using that as a resource. But there's many kinds of coaching. There's many different kinds of people you can consult with uh, to really break this down. So I'd highly recommend finding someone who, um, you know, is specialized in helping another individual achieve their goals um, so they can help you ask yourself the right questions so you can navigate uh, navigate thinking about how you want to organize your time and your life and your world and potentially your career. Awesome. And for those who would like to reach out to you for coaching opportunities, for network opportunities, where should they go? Uh, I would highly recommend uh, just connecting with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, I'm always respond if people are looking for support. Um, so, so please reach out to me there, uh, and I'd be happy to chat, uh, one-on-one -on -one or just, uh, respond via, via messaging. I'm open to anything. Awesome. The links will be there in the description. Ali, what a way to wrap this up. Uh, thank you very much for being a part of this uh, episode. Uh, you've been watching Care Minds podcast. I was your host, Daniel. This is Ali Littman from, uh, Modern Health. Thank you. You've been watching another episode of the Care Minds podcast. Hit the like if you like this episode and drop us a comment below. We'd be excited to hear which topic in health tech product management realm we should cover next. Please consider subscribing and hitting the bell notification. This helps the channel to produce more content like this. See you soon at Care Minds.